Hi everyone, it's Dr. B here to talk to you about the open quantum systems theory of ultra-weak, ultraviolet photon emissions. In this lecture, I'll be revisiting Gerwich's onion experiment as a prototype for quantum biology. This is work that I've recently published in the Computational and Structural Biotechnology Journal. Uh, so if you find this work interesting, please feel welcome to check it out. It's freely available, open access, and it was published December 2024. So, what are ultra-weak photon emissions? Ultra-weak photon emissions, or UPE, are extremely faint light signals emitted by living organisms. These fall mainly within the UVA, visible, and infrared range of the light spectrum, and they're mainly caused by oxidative stress. Matogenetic UPE are distinct from UVA visible IR UPE because they fall into the UVB and UVC spectral regions. They're associated with experimental research on non-chemical communication that may occur between living cells. The concept of mitogenetic radiation challenges traditional views of cellular communication by proposing that cells can interact through the emission and absorption of extremely weak light signals. Alexander Gerwich first identified mitogenetic radiation in the 1920s and its potential role in cell division in his experiments on onion roots. In the figure shown here, we have an onion held at the top with its root extending down and another onion to the left with the root coming forward so that the tip of what is called the emitter root sits facing the side of the so-called receiver root. Now in this setup, it was found that cells on the side of the receiver root facing the tip divided more rapidly than cells on the opposite side. It was then proposed uh, based on subsequent experiments that it was actually the emission of light from the emitter root tip that induced enhanced mitosis, that is cell division, in the receiver root. Uh, further research in the development of the mitogenetic concept implicated a role for non-classical resonance phenomena in mediating the effect. And today I'll be talking about an open quantum systems approach to explain this effect based on Gerwich's historic observations. Although the mechanism of UPE enhanced mitosis is not known, the theory involves two-factor control for cell replication, the internal readiness of a cell for division, and an external signal prompting that division. Gerwich's onion experiment demonstrates this concept, showing replication in receiver cells induced by ultraweak photon emission from neighboring emitter cells. The proposed framework suggests that cells are not only capable of producing ultraweak photon emissions, which is well known, but also of detecting and responding to emissions from other cells, which stimulate the process of mitosis, as follows. As I mentioned, the first step is the internal readiness of the receiver cell, as the cell prepares for division based on internal metabolic factors. Then, UPE must be produced from neighboring cells, which emit ultraweak photons, the signal must be received by the target cell uh, as it absorbs a photon. And as a result, enhanced mitosis can occur as the UPE signal prompts or enhances existing cell division. Research into mitogenetic radiation has yielded significant findings, particularly regarding the spectral range, intensity, and characteristic aspects of the mechanism of mitogenetic ultraweak photon emissions. The spectral range of the mitogenetic UPE is around 190 to 280 nanometers, essentially in the UVC range of the spectrum, although some effects have been detected uh, in the presence of visible light up to 326 nanometers. The primary effect is to initiate uh, most likely protein synthesis, oxidation reactions, and as a result, cell division. The emission source is in metabolically active or possibly also stressed cells that have been stimulated uh, artificially in the laboratory. And the optimal conditions for reception of mitogenetic radiation is in weakened cells in specific 
uh, low light environments where the sample preparation of the receiver cells was very important, important to reproducing the effect. Although many laboratories were able to successfully reproduce the mitogenetic effect, uh, replication issues and lack of consistent protocols led to widespread skepticism of the research. Experimental compounds were likely due to insufficient technologies and misunderstandings of the necessary controls, including the quality of UV transparent materials that were necessary, as well as the quality of sample preparations. In essence, uh, the replication issues, uh, that is to say difficulties in consistently reproducing experimental results across different laboratories worldwide, could be attributed mainly to protocol inconsistencies due to a lack of standardized methods for sample preparation, as well as for UPE detection and measurement. Now, part of this was simply due to technological limitations, as early experiments were hampered by insufficient sensitivity in light detection equipment, or even a so-called biological detectors, uh, which required the preparation of living samples in order to detect the extremely faint UPE emissions. Now, the many complicated steps involved in carrying out these experiments led to a number of control misunderstandings. And as a result, uh, in consideration, uh, inadequate consideration of factors like UV transparency of materials, uh, necessary exposure times, and cell sample conditions uh, created problems uh, with a number of groups. And as a result, uh, the effect uh, fell into disrepute and was even uh, called at one point uh, pathological science. Although many of these issues can be accounted for by methodological deviations between different laboratories, an underlying problem was the lack of uh, essential theory in order to explain the effect. And as a result, I propose that a modern approach to understanding mitogenetic radiation will employ open quantum systems theory and resonance concepts to explain Gerwich's observation based on the hypothesis that UPE-induced mitosis results from a resonance effect that is influenced by cellular metabolic conditions. Uh, the application of open quantum systems principles to biosystems, uh, in fact, considering environmental interactions and dynamics, is essential to the development of a resonance theory to explain how specific frequencies of UPE might resonate with cellular structures and processes. Ultimately, uh, we consider how metabolic chain reactions and environmental factors that affect UPE emission and reception ultimately are involved in controlling the effect. The open quantum systems theory of UPE mechanisms uh, offers to explain these using nonlinear optical phenomena and quantum resonance concepts. This approach may help to explain upconversion of photon energy, enabling the reception of UPE by living cells. A stochastic resonance, another form of noise enhanced resonance, may also play a role in amplifying ultra weak, ultraviolet photon emission signals within cells. These theoretical models suggest that enhanced photon interactions and multi-photon absorption are possible ways that extremely weak light emissions could influence cellular processes. Uh, we're considering quantum effects, especially nonlinear optical phenomena, which may explain two-photon upconversion, and the possibility that resonances can further enhance what are traditionally very weak nonlinear processes as well as the possibility that uh, even classical resonance, such as stochastic resonance, could help to amplify the very faint ultra-weak photon signals. The impact on cells is that enhanced photon interactions can thus influence biological processes, and most importantly, the cell division that is characteristic of the effect. So in order to give you some sense of the mathematics that are involved in these open quantum systems approach, I'd like you to consider what's called the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian approach uh, involving the characterization of the system and environment using quantum operators P and Q, where P represents the primary system of interest and Q, uh, the remaining quota, so to speak, 
of the environment and surroundings of the cell. Uh, now, together, these operators sum to the uh, unity, the one operator, and we can construct a Hamiltonian equation where, in fact, the uh, traditional Hamiltonian H is broken into a primary part and the environmental part Q, which is then reconstructed in the Hamiltonian framework using a scattering propagator, uh, which here is shown uh, similar to a Green's function, as well as the configuration interaction PHQ and its Hermitian conjugate QHP, which is able to account for the system's self-interaction mediated by the environment. Uh, now, this is important in order to construct the conventional non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, uh, which now is expressed as the um, primary portion of the Hamiltonian, PHP, plus the additional non-Hermitian part shown below. Now, this formalism is typically rewritten now, this formalism is typically rewritten as follows, where the primary Hamiltonian is still the projection onto the p-space, uh, plus a detuning term, delta, uh, which shows how the energies are shifted by the environmental interaction, and an additional imaginary term, uh, typically expressed as the line width gamma as a function of the scattering energy. Uh, now, this framework becomes particularly significant when we consider what are known as PT symmetric, uh, that is parity time symmetric or space time symmetric quantum physics. Uh, this is significant because in this new formulation of quantum theory, a uh, number of important amplification or resonance effects uh, can emerge near what is called an exceptional point where the input and output waves of the system converge, uh, coalesce in fact is the term. If we consider a very simple PT symmetric Hamiltonian, uh, we have two modes of the system coupled by the coupling constant kappa, uh, where the gain mode, the incoming mode, is shown with uh, plus I gamma, and the exit mode, the decay mode, which decays at the same rate, is depicted with a minus I gamma. This is a prototypical example of a PT symmetric Hamiltonian where an exceptional point and other unique features of non-Hermitian quantum physics can emerge. Now, I believe this approach uh, enables a prototype framework for other studies in quantum biology, where we can use this framework based on the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian uh, to understand quantum electrodynamic interactions in biological systems. The approach incorporates environmental influences on open quantum systems, which are crucial for describing complex quantum dynamics of living systems. And by incorporating effects such as dissipation, uh, deriving, decoherence, and non-equilibrium conditions, uh, the approach described here aims to capture the essential physical features of life itself. Now, this provides a fundamental template for work in quantum biology by starting with the quantum physics viewpoint. Uh, rather than beginning with the classical viewpoint modified by quantum corrections, I propose to understand the fundamental role of quantum mechanics in biological processes from first principles. Uh, this helps to enable uh, a clarification of quantum classical interactions uh, with the goal of explaining how quantum and classical processes can coexist and interact in living systems. Uh, the goal is then to shift to a foundational research perspective, acknowledging uh, that we may be finding fundamental new phenomena in these kind of systems, and thus it's necessary to emphasize the pursuit of knowledge and understanding uh, with the goal of developing long-term applications, which could be quite different from present-day technologies. Uh, in order to define quantum biology as a dynamical physical system, uh, I want to recognize that many biological systems are uh, highly dynamic, uh, they're often what would be called active matter systems, in fact, inevitably so, and they are significantly influenced by quantum effects. Uh, thus, we can reimagine applications in terms of a multi-field process, 
as we acknowledge the interdisciplinary nature of quantum biology research, encompassing biology, physics, chemistry, medicine, and nanotechnology. The study of mitogenetic radiation opens up potential applications in medical and biological research. UPE and its effects could be leveraged for cancer diagnostics, regenerative medicine, and developmental biology. Future research recommendations include developing controlled experiments to study UVB and UVC emissions, their intensity, and their biochemical impact on cell signaling, growth mechanisms, and therapies. Uh, diagnostic applications of UPE in the UVA through visible and infrared spectrum are already being developed. And I propose that by including UVB and UVC range spectra, uh, we may develop techniques for early cancer detection and new forms of cellular health assessment. Uh, but this can now extend uh, to regenerative medicine as we harness UPE for any kind of tasks involving control of cell growth, ranging from tissue engineering and biotechnology to stem cell research. Uh, this is most fundamentally important for the study of developmental biology, uh, since we now may consider the role of UPE in embryonic and cellular development processes. Now, if you're still skeptical uh, that uh, such an effect could go unproven for so long, I just want to propose uh, quoting Percy Bridgman, a Nobel Prize winner who wrote The Logic of Modern Physics, a philosophy text in 1926, uh, that well, as Bridgman said it, new experience is always possible. And he wrote uh, regarding uh, physical investigations into new frontiers uh, that uh, the new feature in the present situation is an intensified conviction that in reality, new orders of experience do exist and that we may expect to meet them continually. We have already encountered new phenomena in going to high velocities and going to small scales of magnitude and we may similarly expect to find them, for example, in dealing with relations of cosmic magnitudes or in dealing with the properties of matter of enormous densities such as is supposed to exist in stars. Implied in this recognition of the possibility of new experience beyond our present range is the recognition that no element of physical situation, no matter how apparently irrelevant or trivial, may be dismissed as without effect on the final result until, be, it, until it is proven to be without effect by actual experiment. And so in this case, as we look at active matter systems in a UV frequency range, which is typically not explored, uh, I would fully expect to find new physics and certainly would not expect to be able to dismiss it out of hand. Uh, I think uh, we should really take Bridgman's words uh, to heart in this account. Uh, so that's the talk. I would like to thank the Guy Foundation for awarding the Onion Prize for this work and supporting its publication. I'm grateful for their support and, of course, for the support of my colleagues at the Quantum Biology Laboratory at Howard University. If you have any questions, please feel welcome to contact me at my email address, nbabcock at gmail.com, and I'll look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>